Good evening. I'm John Turner, here at the kind offices of the Chesterfield Library Summer Acoustic Concert Series. Uh, and I'm delighted to be coming into your homes and be joining you tonight. Um, the first set of tunes is going to be a set of reels, starting with a tune called The Flowers of Edinburgh. So, as I said, that was a set of reels, the first one being The Flowers of Edinburgh, actually first published in 1737 as The Flower of Edinburgh, singular. The second tune was a tune called Loch Rynach, which was one of the favourite tunes of the Duke of Gordon in the 18th century, who was the patron of the famous composer and player William Marshall. Um, so, that's the way we start. Now, the next set is going to be a strospe followed by a reel. The strospe is called Earl Grey, like the tea. In fact, it's the person after whom the tea was named. <laughs> and then the second tune will be Big John McNeil or Johnny McNeil's reel, 
Now, when you put a strathspe, and the word I'm saying is two words, strath meaning valley, and spe being the river spe. When you put those two words together, strathspe is a type of tune and a type of dance that is peculiar to Scotland. Uh, most different traditions have reels and jigs and hornpipes and airs, but only in Scotland do you have strathspeys. It's a reel that's played with a dotted rhythm, and you'll see that dotted rhythm in this first tune of this set of two. So the Earl Grey is a strathspey. Um, and then we go on to the reel, Johnny McNeil. Now, when you put two tunes together that way, the strathspe and the reel, it produces something that folk in the 18th century in this country, in, in Virginia in particular, referred to as the Scotch reel. That's when you put a strathspe together with a reel. Uh, and it was one of the most popular forms of social dancing here in Virginia certainly in the second half of the 18th century. So if you're thinking people like Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry and John Randolph, they all danced the Scotch reel. In fact, the first tune that I played tonight, Flowers of Edinburgh, was a tune well known to all those gentlemen. Patrick Henry was a first generation American, his father and uncle having immigrated to this country and to Virginia in particular from Aberdeenshire. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had a Scottish grandmother, uh, George Wythe had a Scottish grandfather, and so it goes. So they were very familiar with the kinds of tunes and, in most cases, the specific tunes that I've played for you so far. Well, I wanted to introduce you to Hamish. I have several instruments with, them, with me tonight. Some of them Hamdanes, this one is Hamish, and Hamish is being very careful and very correct and wearing a a mask for COVID. Um, so that's going to, to lead me into something, a responsibility of fiddlers uh, for centuries. One of the things that it was up to fiddlers to do was to compose music and perform it for the local folk uh, that was appropriate to what was going on in their lives. And one of the most common kinds of tunes that would be composed by a traditional fiddler in 18th century and 17th century and 19th century Scotland eh, would be a lament for something that was either a very sad occasion or for someone's passing that was very significant to the community. Um, so I have recently composed a, 
an air called Lament for victims of COVID-19. And unfortunately, we have um, far too many people that have been victim to the virus. Uh, and so it's ongoing, still people dying every day. But so this tune is for them, for their families, for the memories of those that have passed and for those that are all working to try and help people get through this pandemic. So John Turner's lament for victims of COVID-19. Well, I'm going to change instruments now um, after such a somber tune and subject. Um, we'll change the sound a wee bit and brighten things up a bit. So, any of those of you that are in the audience tonight who have been or are about to be or have recently been in the fourth grade. Most of you have played, um, certainly if you're in the Chesterfield County school system, you've played recorders in school. Some of you may or may not know, and some of your teachers might even not know, where the name recorder comes from. It's an old English word that means literally bird song, because the smallest size, one no much bigger than this, um, but much narrower than that, eh, was used for teaching birds to sing particular tunes. The idea was you would sit in front of a caged bird and play the same tune over and over again, hoping the bird would pick up the tune and sing it back to you. 
The only bird in the wild that I've ever been successful with this, or you could say the birds were successful with me, <laughs> is the mockingbird. And I can go out in the garden and play um, on my bird whistle and the mockingbirds will sing exactly what I play. And then usually add something at the end as if to say, no, can you do that? <laughs> usually the answer is no, I can't. Anyway, so here's another strispe, this time on the recorder or English flute as it would have, or common flute as it would have been called in the 18th century. So that, those were tunes. The first one was called Bracken Loam and the second was Wheel May the Keel Row. So we'll go back to the fiddle, back to Hamish in fact. And play another Strispe. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the Strispe is the most quintessentially Scottish type of tune. Most other fiddling traditions share the other tunes, but the Strispe is unique to Scotland. This is a very well-known Strispe in the tradition called, uh, it has at least two names. Many of the names, many of the tunes have more than one title. In this case, this tune is called both Han Muir House and Miss Lyle, two different titles, but the same tune.
Well, I'm going to uh, going to switch fiddles now. So we go away from one with a carved head. I have two with carved heads with me tonight. Um, one is named Hamish and the other one is named George. Um, this violin doesn't have a name and it has the traditional scroll design. Uh, contrary to popular belief, actually, carving a, a geometric scroll design like this is actually more difficult than carving a, a head. Um, so, anyway, quite a few bowed string instruments from the last three or four centuries have heads as scrolls, as rather than the geometric scroll designs or a variety of designs that have been used over the centuries. Now, this violin I have tuned in a different way from the normal tuning. The violin I played for you up until now was tuned in the conventional violin tuning. So that's starting with the lowest string, a G, then going up to the highest string, a G, and in fifths, the violin family is tuned in fifths. So it goes G, D, A, and E. But for ever, really, both in classical music and in traditional music, people have sometimes used the traditional tuning and sometimes they use something different, which the technical term for is scordatura. Scordatura. It means that you're tuning the instrument in a way different than the way it would normally be tuned. So, in this case, I'm got this instrument tuned uh, in scordatura, and in this case, it's the lowest string is a low D, and then another D, and then an A, and then another D. So, that's, um, and sometimes this tuning is called dead man's tuning, uh, and it's, again, used all over the world uh, for a variety of kinds of tunes, or for specialty sorts of tunes. So this is another tune that I composed since we've all been staying at home. I've composed oh, something on the order of 150 tunes. Um, and uh, this is one of them. And it's, it's got a title that you will think strange. The title is The Fiddler's Weird. And a lot of people think that's true, but that's not what it means. <laughs> it doesn't mean the fiddler is strange. Weird in Scots uh, means fate or, um, you know, what's going to happen. Someone's, someone's fate, someone's uh, destiny. And that's what weird means in this case. It's a Scots word, the fiddler's weird, the fiddler's fate or the fiddler's destiny. And um, sometimes, because they were uh, well known in local areas, and sometimes they got involved in political or in uh, military things on the wrong side, and sometimes uh, fiddlers and pipers were executed for one reason or another. Um, and so this is the fiddler's weird is the fiddler's fate. And one of the best known fiddlers who was executed, um, accused of cattle stealing, uh, and he was guilty of that, but uh, he was sort of a Robin Hood figure. His name was Jamie McPherson, and he lived from about 1675 until November 16, 1701, when he was hanged uh, by the Sheriff of Banff. Um, anyway, so that's the sort of situation we're talking about, and that's what this tune is about, the fiddler's weird or the fiddler's fate.
<laughs> so, since I was just imitating bagpipes with a differently tuned fiddle so that we could emphasize the drones and have drones working out on the pipes, um, we might as well go to the bagpipes now. And um, this is a very this is a very civilized version of bagpipes. Bagpipes are not in general very civilized instruments. Um, one of the old jokes was that the, the Romans could not defeat the Picts and the Celts and the people that lived in what's now called Scotland. So they built Hadrian's Wall and threw a set of bagpipes over the wall, hoping that the Scots would find them and use them to self-destruct. Anyway, pipers in the audience will think that's funny. Probably no one else will. But um, so this is a set of red pipes. Um, because they're green. No, it's because they're red. Um, but they're electronic, but it allows me to quote, control volume and other things, which you can't do with a normal Great Highland set of pipes. An old friend of mine had a favorite definition, and he worked with pipe bands for much of his life. And he said, a gentleman is someone who knows how to play the bagpipes and doesn't. Anyway. So, these are the red pipes, and uh, I'll be playing a tune again of my own composition. Scotland has many, many ghosts, and ghosts that have been chronicled and written about and experienced for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and so this tune is about a particular castle, Duntroon, and Duntroon has its own ghost of a piper. Because at one point, uh, the typical, the very long going, ongoing fight in the 17th, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries between Campbell's and McDonald's, and um, one of the Campbell's, Chief Campbell's Piper, had been captured, uh, but was still being allowed to play the pipes and was standing on the parapet of the castle of Duntroon. And um, his chief was sailing back to get him. What the chief didn't realize was that he was sailing into a trap. So um, the uh, piper played a tune that he knew the chief would recognize. And so they turned the, sail, the sailing vessel around and the chief escaped without coming into the trap. Um, when the Piper's captors realized that he had done this, he was executed. And uh, it's the ghost of his, his ghost that is still supposedly um, haunting Duntroon Castle. So, Duntroon's Piping Ghost.
I need to make a very quick technical adjustment and I'll be right back with the red plates. All right. So, again, those of you that are not familiar with the various forms of bagpipes, there are, only, there are over 250 kinds of bagpipes around the world. Basically, every pastoral culture has developed some form of bagpipes. There's some are very large, some are very small. Um, but the, the most famous, of course, are the Highland pipes because of their association with the British Army and the British Empire. Um, but now, there are probably more pipers in this country than anywhere else in the world, would be my guess. So let's try again.
Now, especially for the young folk in our audience, I want to show you something that you may never have seen before. You may think you have, but you probably have not. This is not a toy, and it's not made for a child. It's an instrument that was made specifically in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries for travel. Thomas Jefferson had at least two of them that we know of. Uh, Patrick Henry had one. Uh, John Randolph had one. The famous Scottish fiddler Neil Gow had one. Just about anyone who did much traveling and played a violin in the 18th century had one or more of these instruments because you do not do much traveling with a full-size heavy violin case, either if you're walking 20 miles in one direction, which was common in the 18th century, uh, or if you're on horseback. It's not very convenient to carry a, a full-size violin case on the back of a horse. And it's also not very good for the violin because the motion of the horse um, tends to be not very good for a normal violin. So these instruments were made specifically for travel. And even though this one happens to be violin shaped, it's not made the way a violin is made. A normal violin is 64 or five pieces, thin pieces of wood glued together with an intentionally weak glue. Well, that wouldn't do for something that's being used for travel. So these instruments normally are mostly made from one piece of wood. In this case, it's all one piece of maple from here the neck, the scroll, the back, the sides are all carved out of the same piece of wood. And then the top is a separate piece of spruce that is glued on. But that makes it much more sturdy. Now, these instruments were generally referred to by several words in English. Kit, or dancing master's kit, that's K-I-T. Or the French word was used quite a lot, pochette, pochette, which means little pocket. In Scotland, they just call them posh. <laughs> but anyway, so a pochette or a pocket violin. And it's much quieter than a full-size instrument, but the point wasn't to be the same as a full-size violin. The point was to be very convenient for travel because you could literally carry it in your coat pocket. Or, as I mentioned, Thomas Jefferson had a special pocket put in his saddlebag to carry his pochette. So we'll try a tune uh, from the 18th century called My Love, She's But a Lassie Yet. And we'll end tonight with a, another combination of instruments that is a very old combination, goes back to biblical times, called the pipe and tabor. The pipe being a three-hold instrument that's very similar to the recorder that I played earlier, except that since it has only three holes, you can play it with one hand, leaving the other hand free to play the small drum or tabor. Um, so, Again, some Scottish tunes uh, on the pipe and table. First one is called the Sky Boat Song.
Well, thank you very much indeed for spending a little time with me tonight. And uh, I hope all of you have a safe and healthy rest of the summer. And uh, we'll look forward to the chance to play for you again. All the best. John Turner, good night.